Hi, Alex. Hi, Tisha. How are you? I'm really well. So lovely to see you. Yeah, you too. Oh, it's been a great morning so far. Oh, great. I'm so pleased to hear that. Um, hi, Helena. Hi. Helena and I hi, were Helena. in the, the networking session in the morning. We haven't met before, so that was really lovely. Welcome, everyone. I can see numbers cre uh, jumping up in this room, so I'll just give it a few more seconds as people choose their breakout um, and then we'll get cracking very shortly. Cool, great. I can see, yeah, fab. We've got about 36 people so far in this room. So it's my great pleasure to invite you and welcome you all to this thematic breakout focused on preparing young people for accessing employment, education and training. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to our fab um, session leads that are going to take you through this discussion. So I'll hand over to Alex from Universify, Helena from Impetus and from me from Speakers for Schools. So over to you guys. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining this um, breakout group. And thank you for bearing with us because there's been a slight change in the speakers uh, today. But I am Helena. I'm the Policy and Public Affairs Officer at Impetus. Um, so we kind of work across education, higher education and youth employment. So this kind of thing is, is perfect for our partially of the kind of charities we work with. Um, to start off, we just wanted to give you kind of a brief overview on why we focus on this as an alliance. So um, Impetus did some work called the Youth Jobs Gap Work Series a, a few years ago, and we found that young people from disadvantaged backgrounds are twice as likely to be neat, so not in education, employment or training, as their better off peers. And whilst probably half of this can be explained by qualifications, they're still 50% more likely to be neat, even if they're similarly qualified, there's their better off peers. So half of it is qualifications, but half of it is this kind of other stuff that we've digged into a bit more. And I guess if you were in the skills section um, earlier, they, they probably dug into the, the kind of other stuff that, that goes into getting um, into an EAT status. Uh, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds are also 40% less likely to access higher education. So despite kind of all the headlines about 50% of young people going on to university um, and are too many young people going to university it's still only about 26.6% of um, young people from disadvantaged backgrounds and it's actually 17.2% if you're from the white free school meals group as well so much lower if you're from a disadvantaged background much less likely to access university or other, other forms of higher education um, there's currently kind of no easy way for young people, their parents and their teachers to navigate information, advice and guidance around post-16 and post-18 destinations, and particularly those who do not pass their level one or level two qualifications in maths and English. Um, there's also a gap in continued support at an institutional level for young people transitioning from pre-16 to post-16 and then into post-18. And kind of, as we all know, these transition points can be really pivotal in a young person's career and their access into the next step of education or then into employment. Um, there's a lot kind of going on here in the sector um, in lots of different areas as well. There's been a big debate this year over whether we should move to a post-qualification application system for higher education. So where students will apply to university or perhaps accept their offers once they've already got their um, A-level or level three qualification grades. Um, the org report came out many years ago now, but we are still expecting a response, which should hopefully be coming imminently. Uh, the plan for jobs had really big ramifications for young people with things like the kickstart scheme introduced, which will be winding down in the new year. The introduction of T-levels and whether they're phasing out VTEX or whether VTEX is staying around for another year. Um, and lots of skills reform, skills to be made a real priority by the current government. So there's, there's a lot kind of going on in this space at the moment. Thanks, Helena. So just to think about the rationale of um, why, why we're here and why a collective action approach works. Well, um, I think we've heard a lot this morning already about the value of collective action in terms of shared experience, knowledge, skills, um, collaboration. I think what was interesting when we um, were preparing the session initially is um, Rachel actually asked, oh, um, could we do more? Could we be better, particularly in this uh, with this specific challenge of post-16 um, uh, more recently? And when we look at the timeline of the, the things we've done as, as the FEA, um, uh, we might see kind of ways forward, which we'll discuss. But interestingly, I think from Universify's perspective, how we found collective action so sort of invaluable and powerful. I remember pre-pandemic taking part in a higher education roundtable um, where we not only mapped a young person's kind of journey um, to graduation from primary age and the support there for attainment aspirations, kind of focusing on the, the whole child, which is, is in part led uh, or, or 
is, is part of that ongoing discussion with the digital tools the FPA is developing, which is really exciting. But it also led to the, the spending review submission regarding the auger review, which we discussed. So nice example of how collective action can can really work towards promoting um, kind of collaboration uh, in, in furthering those post-16 outcomes. I'll just hand over to, to Fumbi as well to share a bit of his experience from speaks in schools. Right. Hi everyone, I'm Fumbi, I'm the Policy Officer at Speakers for Schools and I think um, we take a collective approach just because we've seen that um, we, we don't have all the answers and we work with employers across a whole range of industries and what, what we've seen is that, you know, Speakers for Schools is basically set up to, to level the playing gap between independent schools and students in state schools. And those school students going to independent schools, they seem to have better soft skills in terms of communication, problem solving, teamwork, and things that other students might have, but they don't actually count it as a skill. So we started working with Skills Builder just to use their framework to engage with employers so that where employers are actually providing work placements to young people, they can actually say, right, these are the skills we are focusing on in this work placement. We're focusing on, you know, problem solving, creative thinking, and they can then look at the age of applicants. So if they're trying to work with year 10 students, they can, you know, make sure that it's appropriate for year 10 audience. And if they're working with like year 12 or 13, they can go further down the skills builders list and maybe, you know, go to the higher level. And that seems to help, um, you know, students more just because you know they come they come out of those work placements be more confident about the skills they have and being able to talk more about what what they've actually done and you know documenting it when they're applying for maybe new cars or they're doing you know when they're even applying for just normal jobs as well they can just say All right this you know i've done this and this is what i gain out of it so that I think that's why we were taking a collective approach anyway to make sure that you know all the campaigns we're doing, we we're working with people that you know they are more expert and they can just help us deliver for for those young people really. Thanks, Fumbi. And we're basically going to just talk a little bit about some examples of where collective action group has has made some changes and then what they have called for over the past few years. So in two thousand and fourteen called for a careers education to be embedded into the curriculum from the beginning of secondary school and for stronger targets to be given to universities to increase the uptake of for students. And then again in 2017, um, calling for every primary and secondary school in England to have a designated and trained senior leader responsible for developing and delivering a whole school approach to destinations, including a bespoke destination pathway for every student. Yeah, and that led into the call in 2018 for, you know, support for all persistent destinations to become part of three priorities area where FPA was calling for um, encouraging greater collaboration to provide joined up information on all post 16 routes, which is still not happening in every school, you know, and sharing and embedding a school school approach to careers progression in more schools, because you just realize, you know, different schools have you know, different staff members who are in charge of careers. One of our schools, it's the librarian who is actually in charge. So it's quite hard to engage with the kind of school when you, you're trying to find out, you know, who to speak to. And it's actually the librarian. If you didn't know that previously, you, you'd be hard pressed if you're an employer. So that's um, what 2018. And then 2019, um, there was the call for um, investment in professional development, you know, for educators because people like the librarian who's already providing careers information, you know, if, with more um, yeah, professional support and then move on to taking on more responsibilities. And then in, in 2020, um, the working group kind of focused on this area, found one huge outcome was the fact that we need to address kind of the underlying core issues, which actually has resonated with, with me today and when I was in the attainment work, working um, group before this, just thinking about um, all of those aspects that we need to support in a young person to be able to um, help them achieve kind of strong, positive post-16, post-18 outcomes. And in addition, in 2020, the support um, for the careers guidance guarantee and campaign for ongoing careers support. And then finally, up, up to this year, um, kind of support for post uh, promotion of post-16, post-18 pathways has been a core part of 
the answers policy asking submissions but we no longer have a dedicated working group and when we get to the discussion it'll be something we can come back to and explore um, but what we also want to do um, before we have that discussion is spotlight some of the FEA award winners that are doing some amazing work in this space uh, before we do is any member of these organizations on the call it could be great to hear from you um, rather than kind of tell you what, what you do um, so <laughs> if, if you are please do Feel free to raise your hand and um, un unmute. It would be great to hear from you. Hi. <laughs> oh, God. Hi. Um, I'm Phoebe. I'm the founder of The Bridging Project. Um, and we work primarily with students when they're at university and tend to be first generation and low income undergraduates and we're all about improving that really important transition point which has been mentioned a bit today from school to university um, improving engagement and outcomes for those students we're working closely with Oxford University this year and um, two really exciting partnerships with colleges there to not only support students through um, coaching but also to connect students to each other so that they have a sort of joint network of support um, throughout their first year so really great to be here. And I think that the 16 and 18 plus space is a really interesting one um, and often one that can be a little bit overlooked um, and also great um, to be here with Alex. Alex has been massively helpful in supporting our work over the last year and getting us to where we are here um, now. So great to meet you all and look forward to connecting. Thanks, Phoebe. Um, yeah, and Annabelle, if you want to introduce you to get further, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Sure, no worries. Um, my name is Annabelle. I am a program manager at Get Further, and we um, match students. So we do small group tuition in post sixteen further education colleges mainly, but we also work with sick forms and um, external tuition providers as well. So we match graduate tutors or undergraduate tutors with groups of small um, small groups of children, not groups of small children, um, in in these in these spaces to help them get their GCSE maths and English. The main aim is to get them to that magic level four or old grade C, um, and this will enable them to get to the next stage of their career or education. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Annabelle. And that's given me time to search everyone else and the participants. I don't think we've got someone from, from the other, other group, so we're, we can introduce and, and spotlight those. So I'll hand over to Helena from the... Ah, Aaron popped up. Sorry, I miss you. No, it, it was actually my... I pressed the clap emoji by accident before when I meant to raise my hand. <laughs> um, panicked. Uh, so I'm a program manager at Causeway Education. We actually predominantly and historically have been kind of focusing on the transition from school or college to higher education. Um, so the kind of post-18 routes. Uh, we are kind of broadening our spectrum because we've had a lot of focus over the years on that transition to university. So we kind of prioritize targeting um, skill development in relation to application processes so we put a lot of work into students developing academically focused personal statements for example and we do, do a lot of work in relation to uh, strategies uh, and approaches to preparing for admissions tests and that kind of thing so it's targeting aspects of the obstacles that um, students have to overcome um, as part of the entrepreneurship award our focus is kind of spotlighting the apprenticeship space so we're looking at, in particular, degree level apprenticeships and how students can go about effectively tailoring their applications for the sector or the career path that they're interested in. And that's, that's me. <laughs> Thanks, Aaron, and nothing wrong with clapping along with some of the people shouting out their organisations. So um, we haven't got anyone from Power2, um, just to kind of give you guys an overview on what Power2 do. They are a youth development organisation um, with 20 years experience, uh, re-engaging young people from disadvantaged backgrounds who have functioning needs and have disengaged from um, education. You might also know them as teens and toddlers, which is their kind of pairing up programme where they pair a teenager um, with a toddler to kind of teach them responsibility making skills as well but they've now branded as power two but still run that program bumpy do you want to take up skill me would you like me to present up skill me sorry 
it's Lucy. Would you like me to talk about? Yeah, yeah. No, if we've got someone from Upskill Me on the call. Oh, Absolutely. yes. Sorry, I'm having a few technical issues and my headphones aren't working. So apologies if it's quite loud. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm Lucy, founder of Upskill Me. And we are on a mission to help young people learn kind of in-demand skills and access employer encounters. We do this through a blended approach. We have a platform which allows students to build a digital record of achievement and reflect on their skills. We also broker employers into schools for um, industry societies and after school clubs. So, and we also have employability programs. So by combining a platform, which allows them to reflect with in-person programs, we hope to improve the skills, aspirations and confidence of young people, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds. Thanks, Lucy. Um, I think the next idea is to go through into like mini discussion sessions and we were hoping to have mini breakout breakout rooms, but I'm looking for Tisha and I'm wondering if that's not actually possible for us to do. Yeah, unfortunately, Helena, that's, we can't um, break out from the breakout, um, but we could possibly share some questions. People could maybe use the chat to, to interact. Um, but yeah, that would be a cool cool thing for Zoom to iterate on. Yeah, no, that, that's okay. I think that shows our, our limited knowledge of Zoom more than yours, that we were like, oh, we'll just do breakouts and breakouts for this for this session. But um, thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the, the questions are up there. So Alex, if you uh, want to take one or Bambi, if you want to take the full of the first two. Yeah, so um, I think the, the first one, that that's something that, you know, that's um, quite important to me. And I think especially now where Parliament is also thinking about, you know, the new post-16 skills bill and how that will have an impact on, you know, future learning. So, yeah, just want to know what people think we can or we should be doing to, to influence the, the next career strategy as, you know, as mayor or combined authority, we will start getting influence as, you know, looking at the roles of CEC and how, you know, how the, yeah, and even looking at the Baker Clause as they're trying to make that, you know, um, put that into law that schools should, should be telling young people, what, you know, what's the next career step. So how can we or should we be influencing that? It's what I'm interested in just hearing, you know, from what different people's are opinion. All right. Go on. Hi, thank you. Um, sorry, I've got my camera off because my Wi-Fi is really struggling and when I put my camera on it's even worse. So, but I am here and I am listening. Um, I think I'd love to know more about, um, I know that this has been a priority that you, was, you mentioned earlier on a few years ago about the role of kind of careers leads in school. And I think that is quite important. We were mentioning earlier in the networking session that um, it's quite challenging because every single school treats careers very differently. And for me, you mentioned this about, you know, for example, in some schools, it's the librarian that's the careers lead. In others, someone might have a huge amount of time and or budget given to them. And I think that's a really important part of a career strategy is just trying to make sure that careers leaders in school have um, enough time and enough resources to be able to kind of do the job they need to do and also to allow them to properly engage with the kind of organizations that we've got in this school in this call who are obviously doing amazing work but I think sometimes it is tricky to get in touch with schools because you just don't know whether they have the time as I mentioned the resources etc so I think that would be really interesting to hear kind of how much progress has been made towards that goal in terms of senior leadership and also yeah just careers leads in school um how much kind of standardization there is of that because my impression of it is that there's not very much yeah, that's an interesting question. I think part of the Gatsby benchmark is for schools to have their, you know, career information on their website, which is not for every school. So, you know, normally you should be able to click on the school's website and find out, you know, who's in charge of careers, but that hasn't, yeah, that's not the case in every school. And, you know, you try to find out, even if you call the school, then they will tell you it's a GDPR thing and it's just, yeah. So I think that that is definitely one of those things that we yeah has an collective we should still be pushing for just to know you know for to be able to get in touch with school and find out what was the careers lead and yeah and how um yeah and how that's been supported because some schools have the year ed was in charge of careers some have like an assistant ed so it's 
yeah, it's it's a different picture in most schools. And yeah, I'll just leave the floor open to see if anyone else uh, can talk about the experience with regards to that. Just pick up, there's quite an interesting thread in the, the chat around involving kind of young people's voice in kind of shaping any strategy we come up with which I think actually probably touches on in some ways a response to all three questions um, in terms of well what whatever good looks like has to come from kind of young people about what uh, what support they need to to get the best futures for themselves but also how we engage employers and kind of career strategy I think it's perhaps something often often missed and then there was a point around partnership too and so I jumped in there from me but yeah by all means, please, please keep adding in the chat or um, yeah, raise, raise a hand to, to add further. Ellie. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, excuse me. I think one thing that I found through working in on my project, which is basically crowdsourcing application advice and then sharing it for free on our website from students who've already gone through the process is that often the most powerful thing to reflect on that thread about student voice is to take student experiences and amplify them. I think there's nothing better than allowing young people to relate to other young people and understand the kind of process that they've been through and the pathways that they've taken um, and make sure that they're aware of that, that kind of diversity. Um, that's available to them. Mm, that's a really good, good point, Ellie. I think in kind of bringing young people together to kind of like um, support one another. Um, it's a big part of our residentials. The, the idea is bringing aspiring young people from different backgrounds together or across the country. Janice makes a really good point in the chat about how can we ensure young people are aware of the support as well. So any kind of student led stuff needs to also flag, you know, these are the options. And that's probably a really big part of the post 16 work. That we're all doing um l hi yes thank you uh you might have to bear with me while i gather my thoughts because i have so many thoughts as i'm sure we all do on these subjects um i'm l with mvp media we're a small social enterprise in east london and uh, our focus is kind of um on bridging that gap between school to employment for kids young people who might be terminally unemployed uh, due to disadvantages in their social lives and, and you know, everything that um, we've been going through in the past couple of years. We've dealt with a lot of young people um, who are really struggling. However, we, speaking on having a hard time uh, making contact with these young people, that's been a, a primary challenge for us as I'm sure it's probably been for a lot of other organizations. And I just wonder, I don't know if anyone could share anything. Uh, I'm newly appointed head of partnerships at my organization, as well as being in operations there. And um, it's uh, been a real challenge, not only to reach out to young people through schools and through other organizations, but to touch base and form lasting partnerships with organizations. Um, I don't know if there's any platform for communication between organizations in London, but we have yet to kind of find one. Um, but it, it might be a, something we've been trying to sort of facilitate is a, a, an online platform for organizations to uh, make contact with each other. Again, I haven't been able to actually find one that exists, but it would be kind of uh, perhaps a, a helpful thing if, any, if anyone here has any insight or anything about you know, um, how to create these partnerships, uh, if there's a strategy in London, an online platform, something like that. Um, that's, that's something that I think is preventing collective action as it stands for a small so social enterprise like MVP at the moment. So just wanted to jump in and kind of add that. Thank you, by the way. Fine. So I think it, there are charitable partners that are there depending on what, you know, you're, you're planning to do. So 
I know, for instance, we work with different employers across board. It's been interesting to see how things have changed pre in during the pandemic and now, because during the pandemic, the schools we are pushing quite a lot of opportunities to young people and getting them to engage with employers be, just because I think, you know, online schooling, they were just setting it up. So they were pushing down. Whereas now when I speak to young people, they are talking about quite a lot of catch up work and schools not actually prioritizing that, which is quite interesting because those young people are now choosing what to do next. And, you know, at the moment, schools are telling them, well, no, it's just about getting your exams, you know, getting ready for exams. You know, they don't, they know of studies just around the corner again. So I think a lot of schools are focused on just making sure people, are, you know, their young people are passing exams rather than just looking at the old picture that, about what they want them to do next. And yeah, but there, there are different partners that you can work with and I'll, yeah, I'll catch up with you later on that as well. Um, okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Yeah, and I think there's quite a lot, yeah, people answering during, in the chat as well, people you can partner with. I think another interesting that's the statistic for me that I've seen is, you know, young people that do our placement, we do ask them if, you know, the school is, is um, spoken to them or just got them ready for the placement just before um, they joined. And currently it's about 60% are uh, saying no. So it's just, you know, they've got, they've secured a placement, but they're not actually preparing them for, you know, what to ask the employers, what you might gain out of it. And I think whilst, you know, looking at what we can do with government, there's also that challenge of, uh, you know, working with schools and actually making sure that the young people that are getting the opportunities to work with different partners are actually, you know, getting the best out of it by being, you know, by the schools just getting them a bit more ready to ask questions and network and making sure that they, they actually gain the best out of opportunities that they're, they're given. And, you know, I'd be interested to see if anyone has any idea on, on that, like, Thanks for me. Um, and, and thanks everyone for the comments in the chat. I almost wish I could um, record the entire chat and go through it because there's so many lovely points. I'm aware that we've only got kind of a couple more minutes left. Um, uh, so probably worth wrapping up and reflecting um, some really interesting questions in the chat around helping young people distinguish the difference between careers and jobs, whether you can emulate kind of um, long term intervention with short term versions or the, the difference between online, in-person, getting employers involved, lots and lots of questions, which I think um, leads nicely to teachers teach just put in the in the chat thread um, uh, a registration of interest for joining a collective or restarting the collective action working group um, on post-16, post-18 sort of support for young people. So please do fill that, that out if you'd be interested in joining that working group. It sounds like lots of conversations will have to go beyond this because we could talk about this for hours all, all day I have a separate summit for it but per perhaps to wrap up it'd be really interesting um, thinking about kind of from the opening the importance of action if everyone can maybe share their thought on kind of the next step they they think they'll take in terms of um, moving forward with with work or thoughts around supporting young people in accessing employment education or training. It is great to see lots of people partnering up in the chat and forging connections based off what they've said. Where like people are getting like the short trust is quite being put in touch with other people. Thanks, Tisha. I think we also got the 60 second countdown in the breakout room. So if you can't put your, your thing in the chat, be sure to connect with everyone because there's been some really great kind of uh, discussion about partnership. And thanks all for your contributions um, and, and yeah, continuing that collective action uh, approach in the chat and beyond. 